questions? I was having a hard time understanding the correlation between the effects of meditation and between. the effects of meditation on white matter and the lasers that you use in the mice. Oh, well, okay. The, this is a hypothesis which I tested. The hypothesis was that something that occurs after meditation training, changing frontal theta, would have the capacity to change white matter. So I imposed a frontal theta in mice where I could do it in the ACC. And I found it did change oleodendrocyte activation, and it did change G ratio, which is a, having to do with the white matter and connectivity. And it changed one, at least one behavior that we studied, namely fear. That's it. That's the relationship. Now, whether you would call that correlational or causative, I'll let you decide. I don't know whether it's correlational or causative. It's just a fact that about what we found, you know, needs to be replicated, it needs to be expanded, it needs to be doubted, and it has been doubted a lot. Uh, but uh, we put it out there, and we're hoping that it could help illuminate the issue. Yes. Uh, so, in addition to the uh, changes in neuronal activity that you saw and the structure itself, did you guys find any uh, changes in synaptic density uh, with regards to like af the after stimulation? Did you see a difference with long term potentiation at like the synapse area? Because you were talking about. After yeah, no, we activity. did not do that. Okay. So, we don't know. It has been reported in the literature by Lynch and others. I, I can't give you the full citation, but he's at UCI. You could ask him. Uh, that um, theta rhythms potentiate the long-term potentiation. That's maybe not the best way of stating it, but they, they potentiate LTP. And so there is a literature that suggests that. We needed to measure it. We haven't. Yes. When we were talking about nutrition, so I guess you anticipated my question, but regarding the meditation, how long did it last? Did you look into that? Yeah, well, this is a really hard question. We looked into uh, several of the subjects. It wasn't a really large study. It had like 15 in one group and 12 in the other, 13, something like that. Uh, we got some of them back after two months. It looked like it was lasting. It wasn't very clear. But it's not an easy question because you can tell them what you instructed them to do. And of course, they weren't instructed to practice meditation after the experiment ended. So we brought back two months later. We had not instructed them to do any meditation. They didn't report doing any meditation. But whether their brain somehow relaxes into the meditative state at different times in that interval, we don't know. So, Yes, we can say we delayed two months and got a little evidence that it lasted a couple of months, uh, but um, uh, we don't know if, whether, in fact, the brain was actually repeating this exercise in some way or not. So that's why it's kind of difficult to be sure you're, you were right on that. We have proposed, of course, multiple times to multiple granting agencies, uh, Yuan has, the uh, running this again and getting much more data on uh, how long it lasts, but uh, <clears throat> we, uh, he hasn't been successful for reasons that, as a citizen, puzzle me because I think we have kind of the best documented background for this kind of research, but for some reason uh, it hasn't passed the required level to get funding. And it takes funding to do this because you're doing MRIs. Any other? Yes. With regard to the decrease in the G ratio that you measured, were you able to differentiate between an increase in myelin thickness versus a decrease in axon? Yeah, they thickness? both were changed. They were both changed. Both the axon density and the myel myelin increased some. Axon density also uh, actually decreased some. And uh, together, they produced a change in G ratio. Yeah. Follow up question. With regard to the meditation versus uh, relaxation study, I'm sorry. Um, I was just wondering uh, the cognitive tasks that you measured afterwards. Uh, 
would seem to be enhanced by the meditation, but they also might be decreased by relaxation. Yes, there's only one study that also used uh, a resting state, uh, you know, a non-active control. And there's little problems when you have to use a control that doesn't do everything because you don't know about motivation and so on. But that seemed to resemble the, re the relaxation training quite closely. So it's probably not the reasonable hypothesis that might reduce by reduce. One thing relaxation training does is activate the dorsal anterior cingulate. There is a struggle to relax each part. And one thing IBM T2 is avoid that as much as possible because uh, he tries to get you to relax into the meditative state without a struggle. And although mindfulness is similar to many types of mindfulness, many of them do have much more cognitive demands in them, and that might be important. Uh, a lot of uh, unanswered questions here. Yes? I was wondering if you had an idea of the biochemical mechanism that's causing these changes as a potential pharmacological route to doing the same thing. Uh, you mean act what activates the, uh, the oligodendrocytes? Uh, well, we, we used biochemistry to, sh to show that they were activated, but we did not know, you know, let's see, what would we say, exactly what the active ingredient is that leads to the, that leads to the activation. So uh, following the literature and following Lynch's work, who was a consultant on this work but wasn't really involved in the papers, uh, 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 the idea would be that it might, that the mediating event might be calpain or another protease that might change the active state of the oligodendrocytes. That's definitely should be followed up. It's definitely not going to be followed up by me. Uh, I, as having been retired for so many years, I really have to choose very carefully what I do because I, I don't have an institute or anything. <laughs> Uh, where many other people could work and so on. But uh, so there are many questions that arise here that really should be followed up, but it definitely, I'm not going to be a competitor. <laughs> yes? I'm wondering if you have an opinion on why theta, why theta frequency, the low well, frequency? I'm not even sure it is theta frequency. That is, we had some discrepancies, as I pointed out. It could be any low frequency. Yeah, it, I've heard. I've heard others suggest that it, because it's a low frequency, it produces more entrainment of, you know, neural networks, vocal yeah. neurons. It, do you share that opinion, or is there a different explanation? No, that explanation. I don't think that's inconsistent with our explanation. As I said, we don't know for sure it's theta. We know. Uh, I told you my hypothesis. We found that of some. We, we found about equivalence between one and eight in the G ratio, but we found uh, one was more effective in oligodendrocyte activation. So it could be low frequency. It's possible, and again, this would be a really important area of research. There's a lot of research going on in homes around the world, and also sometimes by researchers, but also by people themselves, on imposing DC changes across the frontal lobe. Now, you're imposing a DC change. That doesn't mean there isn't some change in the frequency of activation of different areas. So this could all be one mechanism. And maybe it's optimal as one cycle, maybe it's four cycles, maybe it's six cycles. It could, could be anywhere in that range. Uh, and that needs to be investigated. Maybe I could be a competitor on that one, but I'm not sure. <laughs> yes? Can you do the opposite in your uh, animals? With uh, other frequencies decrease? Uh, yes, uh, 40 frequency decreased uh, uh, oligodendrocyte uh, proliferation and reduced the, uh, well, increased the G ratio, which is opposite of what we got. Uh, and we couldn't find, I mean, one hypothesis that was raised by referees was that, you know, maybe the 40 hertz causes uh, cells to die. And we couldn't find any evidence for that. Uh, so I think it's probably a genuine effect, uh, but uh, it could be caused by something that we don't know any of the mechanism really. We just know the fact that it genuinely decreased over decreased over the dendrocytes over the non-stimulated control, 
and, uh, and also had that effect on the G ratio. Yes? Uh, do you know if any of the subjects in your studies were unable to get into the sort of meditative state? It's rare. Uh, even I was able to get into the meditative state <laughs> with Yuan doing it. And uh, of course, I've put generations of students to sleep during lectures. But um, I, I'm not a meditative trainer or anything. And so I, it was rare that person didn't. We included everyone in these data. We included everyone. And uh, they, whether Yuan thought they were good meditators or poor, we included it all. Most of the studies aren't large enough to say whether some observational measure or some EEG measure would, you know, would correlate uh, with it. So we haven't done any of that. Everyone is included, even if the, the person thought he didn't get in a meditative state, as long as they completed the five days or ten days or whatever the length of the study. Yes. Would you care to comment on the work of Levitt uh, that showed that the pre-activation in the brain uh, precedes your consciousness of a volitional, <coughs> supposed volitional act by 500 milliseconds? Yeah, so. it's a question on the Libet study. I, many of you will know that this is a study which was very, very important at the time it was done, which is now like 20 years ago. But now there is such a literature in cognition about unconscious processes that can affect your thinking, your behavior, and so on, with many different studies. I mean, I, I, I'm a, a fan of the Libet study. I mean, he was a pioneer, I mean, he, and he did this study, and it did show that things that were outside of consciousness were involved. But I think this is all through cognitive psychology. We do know, I think most cognitive psychologists do know how to separate fully conscious results from very low conscious, maybe no. I mean, there could be a border here where you can't quite tell, but I think to get the two groups, it's been easy. And we know that very complicated semantic computations occur unconsciously. Not all that you do, I mean, you don't solve your calculus problems unconsciously, but you can, uh, you can show really, really complicated things. <clears throat> so I think it's, yes, he's right, and he's a pioneer, but there's lots of ways to show that now. Yes? Um, is there a reason why you choose uh, the people who smoke to do meditation? Oh. Do you have a hypothesis that it's going to... Yes, the whole study was a hypothesis that we could reduce addiction. I skipped the slide that was supposed to show that because I, I had to stop right at 2 o'clock. And this, this internal demand. I, I, never, I never, I want people to be able to leave. But uh, our hypothesis was that, uh, uh, that we could uh, uh, change addiction by meditation training. We chose smoking rather than, let's say, an illegal drug like, I don't know, marijuana was then, but of course legal now in Oregon. Uh, because if you choose a, an illegal drug, you raise a lot of ethical issues and so on and so on. Even, even if it's legal in the state, it might be illegal with the federals, and this is, this is very complicated. Smoking seemed to be good. Everyone agrees it's a bad habit. I think, well, not everyone, but most of the world agrees it's a bad habit and so on. So we didn't think we would do any harm if we reduced their smoking. And so that was why we chose it, uh, basically. OK? Is it anything else? Oh, yes. This is a question I get on the smoking study. They, when this, they reported that they only had one cigarette or very few cigarettes, was that because the urge was reduced, or they were able to resist the urge? There's two things to answer that. One is we didn't use self-report. We used a measure of carbon monoxide to get, uh, they, we did get a self-report, but they really, we really had an objective measure of their smoking. And, but we did find that one of the important things was the reduced craving. They reported greatly reduced craving. And that fits with the pathways of addiction that have been talked about, the role of the ACC and the craving for not just smoking, but all kinds of drugs. This is why, I, to me, I don't like to say anything against NIH, but the fact that they haven't allowed people to follow up this study, as far as I know, is 
I think of the bad use of taxpayer money. And I think this is the first time I ever would have said that, that I thought there's so many important things riding on whether we can cure addiction that if, even though I guess most people think we're entirely wrong, but even if we were entirely wrong, it still should be followed up at least to show convincingly we were wrong. But so far, I don't know anyone who has been able to follow up. Any other? I have one more. Just, it's kind of obscure, but is there a way that the data from these studies can be applied to developing new forms of education, just in terms of white matter? Well, there's nothing more important in education than self-control. I mean, Moffitt, the study by Moffitt showed that and these are subjective ratings of self-control in child, early childhood, predict how much income you have, how good your relationship with others are, you know, all the, all the important things of later life. This was in New Zealand at 35 or something like that. Not exactly grown up, but sort of grown up. And um, so self-control is critical to education. And I think we're on the cusp of knowing how to deal with this problem and make a huge contribution to education. So yes, I, 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 don't think, I think that's a really good question. Some places, there are school districts that are using meditation. I don't know if they're actually getting data that would help them evaluate how, whether their form works so they can be using the right one. But if they can improve uh, white matter and hopefully improve self-control, that would be critical to the educational process. So yes, your answer is we've thought about this a lot. All right, well, thank you very much, Mike. <laughs> and see you all in the next Tajib lecture. Just follow your email, and we're gonna let you know when that happens. Thanks so much for coming.